Three, two, one. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Digital Factory Mastermind. Thank you guys for joining today. Uh, I'll just start it off right away by introducing uh, your instructor for this next hour, Walker Reynolds. Hey, what's up, guys? Um, all right, so we're, we're just going to get right into it. All right, so um, where are you guys right now? Um, you are at, you're in our free digital mastermind training, okay? So that we, we call this hour one, it's called the foundation. Digital mastermind is, um, it, this is the first hour of really what is gonna be five hours over the next two weeks. There's a there's a, a paid course we're doing next week that we decided, you know what, there's pieces of this we wanna share with absolutely everyone. And so that's what the foundation is. So the foundation is this, the base, um, the base foundation that the people who are gonna be participating in the course next week they really need to go through this and we don't want to waste waste this hour the foundation that we've shared with the entire community as part of that so that's what this is um this is more in depth than what our it's it's a summation of everything we've ever put on youtube our whole philosophy but it's much more in depth than that we actually go through the steps of digital transformation and that's what i'm going to be sharing here okay um i'm going to try and keep this organic all right so um there is a method to the madness but i i can see the questions up here on my left um, so if there's a really important question that gets chimed in that somebody needs to ask, ask it. Zach and Vaughn will keep an eye on those questions and, um, and I'll, I'll answer them um, right in the middle of the presentation if it's appropriate, okay? Um, so if this isn't meant to be like a webinar or anything, it's meant to be organic, let's treat it as if we're all in the same room and I'm in front of a whiteboard, okay? All right. Um, so, so make sure you guys get a, a notepad because uh, you're going to want to write some of this down. Yeah, yeah, you definitely want to keep these notes. You, you can take screenshots. You can do, you know, everybody's got permission to take screenshots and stuff. There's nothing in here that, um, I mean, the secret sauce is in here for sure. Like what, what do we do as a company? What does Intellic Integration do as a company to dig help businesses digitally transform? The secret sauce is in here, but I, I wouldn't say there's anything in here that we call like um, intellectual property or anything. This is what we're trying, we're trying to create an army of people who think like us. So that's what this is. All right, so let's talk about the foundation, digital mastermind, all right? So it's all about digital transformation, all right? So uh, what is digital transformation? The goal of digital transformation up here in the upper left-hand corner is to give stakeholders the data and information they need when they need it in the form they need it. So the goal of digital transformation is to create the smartphone for business. That, that's what it is. It doesn't have to be a phone, but we want to create the functionality we all get in a smartphone. And we want to do that for individual businesses. Okay, That's really digital transformation. It's paper to no paper. Uh, we accomplish this goal by leveraging IIoT technologies and principles to digitally transform businesses from the third industrial revolution to the fourth. Okay. So the, that's, these, this is our goal. Every, every class that we put together, everything is from that goal and that methodology. Um, the agenda for today, uh, we're gonna talk about how to plan a migration to a digital factory, okay? John McKeon actually is on here, I saw, and uh, John had a meeting this morning. He and I were emailing yesterday, and we actually went over a lot of this content. I, I actually sent him an email that contained a lot of this content. So you guys are getting the exact same information that I'm giving other integrators, other OEMs, other vendors who are asking us how to do this, okay? Um, and some of this will be familiar to John. So, and hey, John, John, John happens to be signed up for the mastermind next week yeah. too. So ho hopefully John, uh, that the meeting this morning went, went awesome. Um, agenda, um, we're gonna plan a migration to a digital factory. Uh, number two, we're gonna teach you the right questions that you need to be asking yourself, okay? Number three, we're gonna talk about the right steps you need to be taking to transform. My original goal was to try and get through like a presentation in 30 minutes and leave the second 30 minutes to just answer questions. And I can draw on the board or whatever. We did a dry run. There's no way I'm gonna get through it in 30 minutes. Maybe I can do it in 40 and we might be able to leave 20 minutes to, to answer questions. I'm perfectly fine with going over the hour and you know staying as long as we need to stay. So uh, I don't have any issue with that. Um, what's important is that we get the message out. It's not what it, it's not important that we do it in 60 minutes. Okay, for me, um, our audience today we have more than 400 plus people um, who I, I Zach can give me the exact numbers, but um, 
our, our response rate for this was like 80% or something crazy, like an absurd number. Yeah, we have um, 70 people in the live chat right now. And everyone who signed up re using the registration link, they're going to get, get a copy that. emailed to them. Right. We had like a absurd, it was like an 80 something percent response rate, which is just not normal in this industry. So what did that tell us? Is that there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of people who want to learn about digital transformation. Um, who are who's on the call? It is it's engineers, it's software developers, it's it's management, it's operations managers and CTOs and CXOs of end users, large Fortune 500s, smaller manufacturers. Those people are on this call too. There are IoT vendors here. So that is you know whether you're the traditional you know. Um, Rockwell Automation, and you're trying to figure out how to leverage IAOT for your consumers, or whether you are Hybyte, for example, Hybyte who created the um, the intelligence hub, which is specifically an industry 4.0 product um, that you're on this call. And there are a lot of business development people there. There are people here who are trying to figure out how to sell digital transformation. And John McKeon will tell you that the first thing I will say when it comes to selling digital transformation, it is don't sell digital transformation. That's not what you're doing. What you're doing is you're speaking about a vision and trying to find people who, who need to be helped, okay? Some housekeeping stuff, okay? Sorry, we have to spend the 10 minute, first 10 minutes doing this, but it's gonna be helpful. If you've taken the IIoT mini course, that's really gonna help you in this, okay? You're, you're gonna understand the language that I'm talking about. Um, if you're a member of the Discord channel, um, so uh, we created, the Discord server because there really was no place for like like-minded individuals to share ideas and collaborate without getting inundated by salespeople. So we created this, this Discord server so that we can put all of the people, this army that we've created together and we can collaborate in real time. So highly recommend you, uh, you um, Join the Discord server. Zach will make sure there's a link in the in the this video so that you can join it. It's an open, um, it's an open um, environment. Uh, we moderate it. Um, myself, Zach, um, I think Vaughn is a moderator. We, uh, I think we may be making Muhammad a, a moderator. Right? I, I'm not sure. There will be other people in the community who become moderators, and and our really our task is to make sure everybody lives by the rules. The big rule is let's collaborate. Let's treat people the way we want to be treated and no active selling. There's everything that I keep, what I tell Zach is we let's not be actively selling on here because that's the best way to scare people away. So none of that crap, let's share ideas. But um, there is an opportunity to, to make connections which could lead into business opportunities there organically. Correct, as long as it remains organic, no one cares. I, you know, if somebody says, hey man, I'm looking for PLC technology, which somebody did yesterday, and they were like, I want, I'm being, he's an end user. He's like, I'm being tasked with, with picking the right technology for these new production lines. And he's like, does anybody got opinions on PLCs? And I'm like, yeah, Opto 22 Groove Epic. I mean, if what you want is something that supports the technology you got to have, he, here's the list of PLCs that does it. Siemens supports it with their MQTT function block. Opto 22 Groove Epic supports Spark Plug B. So does Easy Automation's Easy Rack PLC you know, Maple System, CMT, SVR, we shared that information. If Benson was on, I tagged him, but if Benson was on, he could have chimed right in and said, yeah, here's the Groove Epic, here's some spec sheets. But to go in and have somebody, you know, it's that's different, that's organic than somebody coming in going, hey guys, I'm having a yard sale tomorrow and come on over. Um, our YouTube channel, uh, it, obviously, I mean, most people here have probably seen our, our uh, videos, but um, sorry, our YouTube channel. I want to highlight this because there are some of the, there are some people on the chat who are from the big boys. So that is Rockwell Automate. There are people from Rockwell here. There are people from Inductive Automation on here. There are people from Siemens, PTC, Aviva, Schneider. They're all here trying to figure out how they should shape their business. I'm going to start by giving you some advice. Uh, this is our YouTube channel. We have 4,700 subscribers and we generally get somewhere between 1,000 and 16,000 views on most of our videos. I don't think any of our videos end up being less than like say six, 700 views. That's because we share information that's valuable to the community. Most people would say it's stuff they can monetize, okay? 
Rockwell Automation's got 28,000 subscribers and their videos basically get 100 to 200 videos. What does that tell you? Your content is shit. Every person who's on here is going to tell you the exact same, well, won't tell you the same thing. They think it, but I'm the one who's gonna tell you, you can get mad at me for it. Please improve your content. Create content that's valuable to the community and people will watch your videos. Even Inductive Automation, who is a leader, who is a leader in the industry. They, they give away their training for free. They allow you to download the technology without ever talking to anybody. I mean, they there's no company on the planet that does it better than inductive automation. They have a little 5,000 subscribers and they still only get a hundred views per video. Siemens holds true. They got 200,000 subscribers and nobody watches their videos. PTC has got 20,000, nobody watches their videos. Aviva's got 4,800, no one watches their videos. And Schneider's got 100,000 and no one watches their videos. If, you, if you're a big company and you're trying to figure out how to, how to you know, capitalize on IIoT, start by being a leader. And you guys have the bully pulpit, you have the audience, please do that. I spent $200,000 of my own money, more than that, more, almost a quarter million dollars in the last almost two years, getting this message out, my own money. And we don't sell anything, we don't take money from vendors. We don't, I mean, I'm spending the money myself to educate the community. And it's almost a quarter million dollars now at this point. Um, you guys have bigger budgets than I do. All right, YouTube channel is very valuable, obviously. Uh, mentorship, we have a mentorship program. If you're an engineer and you wanna, you wanna learn how to do Industry 4.0, uh, we basically have a mentorship program that gives you direct access to us, custom content. But most importantly, we take you through our step training the same as training our engineers go through. So step one, step two, step three, step four, and it basically gives you the foundation. So mentorship is a is a good uh, good option too. Uh, digital mastermind right now, step one is what you guys are doing. And then there is a step two, which is next week. All right, I wanna go through a couple of important concepts and then we're gonna go through a couple of slides. Um, important concepts for digital transformation. Burn these into your brain, please. If, if there's any notes you take, start with these three bullet points. Number one, digital transformation is a strategy. It is not a project. It's also not a series of projects. It's a strategy. It's a paradigm. It's a way of thinking, okay? That's what digital transformation is. It is you are digitally transforming your business, the way you operate. If you're an engineer, you are helping them digitally transform their business, okay? So when you do that, what's very important is that you talk about digital transformation in, in terms that helps, that, that applies to the manufacturer that you're gonna digitally transform, right? Everybody has seen this automation stack, right? The six layer that we use, PLC Edge, HMI, SCADA, MES, ERP, and cloud. If you put that in front of um, a manufacturer, some of the people in the business will understand it, but not everyone. But if I give you, if I use this chart here on the right, and I put this in front of a manufacturer, this is a language they speak because this is every manufacturer on the planet. Every manufacturer starts by selling stuff, then they plan to make it, then they execute the manufacturing of it, they monitor and control their operations, they monitor and control their machines, they inventory the stuff that they make, they ship the stuff that they make, they order materials for more stuff to be made, and they invoice for the stuff that they sold. And then they go back to it all over again. That's every manufacturer. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if we're talking about Pfizer. It doesn't talk if we're talking about, you know, Joe Blow's um, screw factory. It's exactly the same thing. So when you're talking about digital transformation, we're and what we're really talking about is integrating business processes together. Talk in the language they speak. Okay. Don't don't use things like this. I mean, I see this thing and I get so mad. I actually sat in a presentation. Um, an, uh, an integrator gave, uh, actually a, a really damn good integrator came, uh, you know, in the Midwest and they came in and showed this maturity level chart. This, this, this is for school, all right? This is for MBAs. This is for engineers. Don't talk in these terms because nobody in the room, you know, your eyes are going to glaze over when you do this shit. Talk in the terms that manufacturers understand. Okay, that's critical to even that, that it's critical to even getting manufacturers to understand the value of digital transformation, right? Number two, 
digital transformation is about transforming the way manufacturers operate their businesses by leveraging data that they generate every day, but they never or rarely consume it in real time, okay? That data that they generate every day came from the third industrial revolution, which was automating their manufacturing processes. Manufacturers started creating this data by installing PLCs, you know, by installing hardware at their, you know, at their facility, something that looks like this, I, you know, I'm an engineer. Most of these people on here are engineers. Um, you know, this is on my desk. I just saw Sean Terrell commented. I, I here, here are some things I can guarantee. Sean Terrell, who has something exactly like this at his house. Um, um, Derek Stickle has something exactly like this at his house. A every engineer who wants to get into digital transformation and help companies digitally transform stays very close to the technology and understands how to integrate disparate technology together. This is my desk literally right here to my left. So yeah, I know you do, Sean. <laughs> um, all right, let me give it, sorry. Uh, they never or rarely consume that in real time. That's what digital transformation is about. It's about taking that data that they already generate and, and help them change the way they operate their businesses by, by using it, okay? Um, and the last thing is, with respect to digital transformation, and this is absolutely the hardest part for people to understand, without question, okay, is not everyone can be helped, okay? You, if you're an engineer working for an end user, if you are an engineer working for an OEM, if you are a, if you are a, uh, an executive, if you're Tony Payne, who created Highbyte, um, who was the former president of Kefware for many, many years, you, the first thing that you have to understand when it comes to digital transformation is not everyone can be helped. You have to invest your energy on the businesses you can help. And you do that by, start, by starting with finding people who admit they have a problem, okay? You cannot help an organization who doesn't think they're broken. You don't start by convincing them they're broken. You have to invest your time in the people who already know they have a problem, okay? Because, that, that, because you have to help people digitally transform the way they do business, the way they actually operate, that is the authority that they give their IT department from, you know, the, to, to the, their philosophy on cloud-based technologies. In order for you to be able to do that and help them digitally transform, you have to start by asking yourself the actual question, do they know they have a problem, okay? Um, some important definitions, all right, real quick, and we're gonna go over that stack drawing. Industry 3.0, is the automation of manufacturing processes. Um, this created digital data, okay? So that is that from relay logic to PLCs where we started storing um, transitions in PLCs, we added HMIs, we added SCADA, we added MES, they all started creating data. Um, industry 3.0 is, is the creation of that data, all the stuff we did to start creating it, okay? Industry 4.0 is, um, Industry 4.0 is the digital digital integration and automation of business processes, okay? This creates information. Now, I know that that sells salesy, so I'm gonna explain what it means. Um, in this automation stack here, uh, and for those of you who wanna know how I'm actually doing this, I have my iPad here, I'm using OneNote, I'm drawing on my iPad. Um, there were really smart people during the third industrial revolution, there were smart people who work at manufacturing facilities who said, hey, man, I've got all this data in the PLC. I've got, you know, rising and falling edges of, of uh, you know, sensors that could tell me I have problems, right? I want to I put that in a database. I want to put it in a historian. I want to be able to look at it over time. So during the third industrial revolution, what we started doing is what we call linear integration, okay? Linear integration is the concept that we integrate our process from the plant floor up to the, the enterprise um, one step at a time, okay? So that started out by connecting the PLC to the HMI. You guys have seen this in one of our videos, okay? That's a discrete connection and it costs money to do it. Also, it creates two separate data silos, one in the PLC, one in the HMI. Then we did the same integration to the SCADA system, okay? That also costs money. 
what, one of the things that we can do is we can put an OPC server out here, shout out to Matricon and Kepware, and we can take our PLC data and we could put it in the OPC server. And then we could have both the SCADA and HMI systems get it from OPC, okay? Um, this is, this is where that OPC versus MQTT argument comes from. The next thing that happens is they want to digitize their MES process. So instead of having a work order on a piece of paper and a traveler that, that follows the raw material all the way through to the finished good in, on paper, they want to turn that into a digital, um, uh, digital traveler. So what they'll do is they'll go to the SCADA system because they, they want to calculate OEE, overall equipment effectiveness, and they, they'll connect the SCADA system directly to the MES system and to start doing those calculations. We create a new data silo in the MES system. Then we discover, oh, the MES system needs information from the ERP system. So we'll create a connection. Well, for those of you who, who work in this space, getting that connection created is actually next to impossible. I, you know, I, this, is the, this is the IT piece, okay? When we talk about the emergent, the con convergence of IT and OT, ERP and cloud is the stuff that the IT department owns. And those are the assholes nobody wants to talk to because they always tell you no, um, right? And I, I'm not offending here. There's not a person on here who's gonna defend any IT department on the planet. So um, that doesn't mean that they don't have an important job. It doesn't mean that they don't have an important mandate. What it does mean is that it, it, they are a barrier to success when it comes to digitally transforming, which is what people are trying to do here on the left. Um, um, what they're trying to do here on the left, you, you know, using industry 3.0 methodologies. What did we learn about the, the it, during industry 3.0? The answer is we learned that doing that this way doesn't work. Okay, it doesn't scale, it costs too much, and it doesn't give you the functionality you need. That's what we learned during this process. Okay, this is what we've all been doing for the last 10 to 15 years. We've been trying to do it that way, linear, Linear integration, okay? Um, all right, let me go down here to our slides. I wanna talk about, um, uh, well, actually, let me finish with the definitions. So the stack drawing. Industry 3.0 is the automation and manufacturing processes. Um, industry 4.0, I used to work in IT and still am in that way, in a way, LMTA. Um, industry 4.0 is the digital integration automation of business processes, okay? So industry 4.0 is going from that linear integration to the digital integration and automation of businesses by using a unified namespace. We're basically going from solution stack, a stack of solutions that we're integrating linearly to a technology stack where we treat everything like a node. Okay, so, and, and let me, I wanna do a very important comparison here, okay? Doing it on the left-hand side is like, um, these are all couches. Think of this. Uh, my PLC Edge software, it could be uh, a Control Logics PLC. When I buy it, when I build a machine using a Control Logics PLC, am I going to have that PLC forever? That is for 100, for 100 years, for 200 years. The answer is no. Why? Because eventually that PLC is no longer supported, i.e., uh, PLC 5, Slicks, you name it. They end. They get. They come to an end of life. You need to remove them and put something else in its place. Now, anyone who has done that knows that this is incredibly difficult to do. Okay, it's expensive. It's expensive. You lose production time, and it's a pain in the ass. It becomes an even bigger pain in the ass if you have discrete linear connections between that PLC and your SCADA, MES, and ERP system, because now what you've done by removing that PLC is you've broken those connections and you have to rebuild them all over again from scratch, specific linearly to that new technology, okay? We, we call that building a wall on top of a couch. When I buy a couch in my home, I don't expect that couch, the couch is the piece of software, the specific piece of software. Couch equals in touch, couch equals control logics PLC. I don't buy a couch and assume it's going to be a foundation of my home. Therefore, I don't build walls on top of it. Why? Because in 15 years, when I'm gonna replace the couch, I don't want the, fall, the wall to fall down. The wall is this linear integration on top of it. 
And you can talk about it from any layer. You know, don't make don't make the software solution, don't make the software solution um, um, fundamental to the foundation of your business. Okay, that's why we use this the, this concept on the right of the unified namespace. We treat software as a node in the ecosystem. Wait, can okay? you can you say that again for the people in the back? Don't treat your software as what? Don't treat your software as a foundation for your business. A specific piece of software. Like don't don't go buy OSI Pi as your historian. Okay. Don't create a software stack. We're going to talk about this. Software stack versus technology stack. Okay. What most organizations are doing is they are building a stack drawing that they turn on its side. So they'll take this stack and they'll turn it so that you've got column, 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 right? And they'll have edge going all the way to cloud. And, and in, the, in each column, they're gonna put a piece of software. They don't put technology there. They don't say, they don't say I'm gonna have an MQTT broker that supports Sparkplug B. They say, I'm gonna put OSI Pi in the middle. And they use all of the, they use the unique things about OSI Pi to create their namespace, which means that they can't remove OSI Pi without breaking everything. But if they build a technology stack, that is, I'm going to use, um, I'm going to use PLCs that support IIoT technology and QTP. It's going to support Sparkplug B. It's going to support report by exception. It's going to support Sparkplug B. I'm going to use HMI and SCADA software that supports this list of technology. I'm going to use a historian that supports this list of technology. I'm going to use an ERP that supports this list of technology. If you build your stack on the technology, then it doesn't matter what solution you pick. It doesn't matter. You plug the solution that meets that technology requirement into your ecosystem. You're creating an ecosystem. It's just like with your phone, right? So when you download an app, I have an iPhone. So when you download an app from Apple's store, the app store, what you are doing is you are downloading a solution that meets technological requirements. Apple created a technology stack. Then they submit that stack to app developers and they say, you got to build it. You got to meet these requirements. Apple's the one who filters it for us so that when we download the application, we know it meets that we know that it meets the the um, um, the the minimum requirements, the technological requirements. I want to answer John Sullivan's question. Uh, isn't that what many did saying OPC UA? The answer, John, is yes and no. We tried doing that. So if you look at the screen right now, John Sullivan, um, we all tried doing that with OPC UA. What's the one thing that we all? What was it that we we learned about OPC UA? And that is. It doesn't scale at an enterprise level. Okay, we couldn't, you can't use OPC UA, you can't use OPC UA to, um, to pull and respond and get, get the data at the transitions that you wanna get it at. That's what we all discovered. Part of the reason that we moved, what, why is it everyone flipped out when Arlen Nipper showed us at the MQTT presentation six years ago or whatever at ICC? The reason everybody got excited was because MQTT eliminated all the integration time of connecting to all the nodes. Number one, that's why everyone got excited. What made people stay with MQTT is when they started, they saw how lightweight it was, how it was report by exception and edge driven. Okay. That you, John, you're absolutely right, man. I, I knew, and I knew, I know you already drank the Kool-Aid, I, but it's a, it's a very, very good question. Because that is a question everyone will ask along this journey. When, when, they, when you start going from thinking industry 3.0 to industry 4.0, you go through that process. Well, why don't I just use those PCUA? And the answer is because it doesn't, it won't scale. Now, Stefan Hopp, who has sent me several emails saying, Walker, you're not fair to OPCUA. Um, and he sent me a long email, you know, hey, we do this, we do that. Uh, OPCUA is not the enemy here. OPCUA has a place in the technology stack, but it is not the foundation of the technology stack. That doesn't mean that there aren't companies that can settle on OPC UA and be satisfied. But most of the companies we work with, OPC UA can't be part of that technology. 
because it, 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 it won't scale for lots of reasons. A lot of it has to do with bandwidth and being able to get actual, actual rising and falling edges. And we'll talk about that, that later. Uh, I want to quickly go through the challenges here. So we're familiar with the stack now, guys. So one, one quick question, uh, because ahead, it's related to what you just talked about, you said, don't build your business on a software technology, build it on a technology stack. Well, the obvious question would be that you've mentioned Hybyte or several other softwares could be the unified namespace. What happens if you need to replace Hybyte? How is that different? So here, so the answer to that question is really quite simple. I can remove Hybyte and put a different piece of software in it in its place without breaking it, without breaking the the architecture. Because That's why? The, because what Hybyte? Because Hybyte is is go, is edge driven, report by exception. MQTT compliant and will support Spark plug B. So what is what does Hybyte do? Hi, what Hybyte does is it takes asset models. It takes a, it create it gives you the ability to create an asset model, a UDT, and because it supports Spark plug B, it can it can publish its asset structure into our unified namespace, which require and it doesn't have to be. Spark plug B. I'm going to use MQTT because it's what we use, but it doesn't have to be MQTT. Everyone asks that question. What it has to be is a technology that allows you to build ISA 95 from all the nodes. That's basically what you, is the minimum requirement. Highbyte creates an asset structure, asset frames, and then it publishes it over Spark plug B. Okay, it it allows you to publish it over Spark plug B. You can um, you can unplug Highbyte. And you could put OSI Pi right in right in its place. Okay, use OSI Pi's asset frame tool, and publish over Spark Plug B to your MQTT broker, plug and play. You could take Highbyte out. You could put Ignition in its place, and all you would have to do is create the asset frame in the ISA 95 structure, point to the point to the broker, and publish. So the point is is that if I take Highbyte out. As long as I as long as I take something back in and plug it in, then I those asset frames get regenerated. What I'm saying is, don't use Highbyte to create all of the objects. Treat Highbyte as a node, not as the foundation. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Highbyte uh, will help you build the unified namespace, but you could easily have that be another piece of software and swap it out. That's my point. My point is, is that the foundation is the technology stack. The software is a node. The software is a couch or a bed, a mattress. The, the, the technology stack is the, is the foundation of the home. Okay. And, and, and we, and by the way, people don't think this way. Everyone on here, um, most people don't think in terms of the technology stack. So this is one of the problems that Rockwell has and Snyder has, they're trying to sell turnkey integrated solutions that are 75% proprietary. So if you, if you, if you have a very specific um, technology stack that you want to leverage to digitally transform a business, if you go to Rockwell, they're not going to meet the requirements because Rockwell's model is to develop a software stack that you will fix you'll develop the solutions with, okay? It, it, it's a paradigm shift in the way that we think. Um, all right, here we go. Right, that's exactly, Esteban's correct. Avoid dependency by taking advantage of MQTT on all the stack, exactly. That's exactly the point, all right? All right, so let's talk about the challenges at each layer of the stack here, okay? Um, we're gonna start at the bottom. PLC edge, so th th what are the challenges in digital transformation? Number one, at the edge, PLC programmers generally specialize on one platform. Very few can develop at a very high level on more than one platform, okay? At the HMI layer, again, specialization and a shift from hardware-based HMI to software-based HMI, this blurs SCADA and HMI together. It's one of the challenges that we have. Now, I asked the question in the Discord yesterday, what's the difference between SCADA and HMI practically? And the answer is, is that HMI is generally on the line now and SCADA is plant or area level, it's software based and HMI is generally like panel B plus, that kind of thing. At the SCADA layer, one of the biggest challenges is that advanced development in SCADA platform, SCADA software 
requires advanced skill and most developers specialize in just one platform. So when you're building a team to help someone digitally transform and they use many different SCADA platforms, you have to have someone who specializes in all of them in general. Um, advanced MES systems are really rare. Organizations define MES differently. This is anybody who does MES will tell you they see different OEE calculations all the time. By the way, there's only one OEE calculation, but people will call OEE. They'll say, hey, we calculate OEE, except I only multiply availability and performance together. And the way I get my availability number is not the way that, um, you know, OEE is supposed to be calculated. All right. At the ERP layer, this layer is normally owned by IT and accounting and it's protected. Sarbanes-Oxley for all your publicly traded companies requires that they, they, they protect that data. Well, IT takes that to a, an extreme by not only do they protect it, they just don't let anybody access it. Okay. Integrating with this layer is often very difficult, expensive, and it's fraught with resistance. Uh, at the cloud layer, the biggest challenge we have is that it's the newest layer. ID departments are resistant to use cloud services. One that we have um, on-premises solutions are expensive and developing solutions that produce actionable data require that data from the PLC edge be congruent. What does that mean? If I'm gonna do machine learning in the cloud, if I'm gonna do machine learning in the cloud and I wanna predict failures, it's very important that what's living on the edge and what I'm and what I'm and the data I'm consuming in the cloud are congruent. I can I can take the path to a piece of data that's in the cloud and and that can tell me where to get to that in the on the edge. And that really doesn't exist. We create data silos. Uh, what does the landscape look like right now? Less than 5% of, of companies are utilizing big data, but most want to. 99% of all manufacturers have some form of ERP. This is how they turn sales into production. Less than one in three manufacturers have MES software. Many manufacturers still use manual entry here, think Excel. Less than 50% have SCADA software. 90% have HMI and 99% have PLCs and smart, smart equipment. It's like 99 and three nights, okay? So that that's what the current landscape looks like out there, okay? One of the biggest problems that you have when you want to digitally transform a business is that if you don't, if a company doesn't have digital MES, you have to have a plan to get it to them. This is why we shot that video. This is why, you, this is how to calculate OEE and why you have to, why it's not optional. And the answer is because that OEE calculation is very, very important context to help you automate your business, okay? You need to know levels of efficiency in order to make operational decisions. All right, so where do we pick the fruit? For all of you guys out there, where where should we be focused at? Uh, at the cloud layer, we wanna collect data from all layers and we wanna run that data through algorithms and then send actionable information back to the MES SCADA layer. We wanna, we wanna do predictive analytics in the cloud. That's the fruit you're picking in the cloud. At the ERP layer, our number one goal has to be integrating ERP data down to the plant floor and getting performance data back to the ERP and the IIoT infrastructure, okay? Right now that doesn't exist, okay? Uh, at the MES layer, we wanna either be giving them their first MES system, we wanna be standardizing their data on ISA 95, we want their MES, their manufacturing execution to be enterprise class, what does that mean? Not standalone for individual plants, and we wanna create an IIoT infrastructure. At the SCADA layer, we're either giving them their first SCADA system or we're making their current system enterprise class and plugging it into an IIoT infrastructure. At the HMI layer, we wanna integrate this layer natively with SCADA and the IIoT infrastructure. That is, HMI consumes data from the PLC and it consumes actions from operators, but it also creates context. When you, when you do alarm management inside of an HMI, the, the alarm list, the alarm log, the alarm journal, the alarm set points, the alarm transitions, when they were cleared, all of that is context that can be used in a digital ecosystem. And no one consumes that at all right now. That, that data lives in the HMI and no one consumes it. And then at the PLT edge layer, you know, the, the fruit that you pick is you upgrade the legacy hardware and the IOT and, uh, uh, and plug it into an IOT infrastructure. This is what infrastructure looks like today. So you use, generally use OPC UA to go from the PLC edge all the way up to MES or Modbus in some cases. Um, we have a little bit of SQL. We got some custom application interfaces, APIs, and then other. There are other places. You know, we have serial communications in some places. Can you we explain have, 
can you explain um yeah. i i understand what's going on now but can you explain this chart a little bit better what's going on here this is this is the, the if you go into any manufacturer right now the, if you say hey what's the infrastructure that you have th this is what you're going to see you're going to see opc ua in some places connecting some elements remember keep our conversation within the context of their business okay so you'll notice this, what I drew here, lines up with this stack, okay? So if you if you look, PLC Edge in blue, HMI in blue, SCADA in orange, MES in orange, we wanna put everything within the context of their business. So if I'm looking at their infrastructure, if I'm looking at the infrastructure of an organization, this is pretty much what you're gonna see. From the orange down to the blue, you're gonna see OPC UA and Modbus, okay? Uh, at the ERP layer, you're gonna see some SQL and API stuff. Um, and uh, cloud is other. Yeah, or, or you're going to see uh, some other technology. Sorry, Sean. I want to make sure I um, I want to uh, make sure I answer any important questions. This is what the infrastructure will look like tomorrow. Now, that is, we're still going to use OPC UA. We're still going to use Modbus. We're still going to use SQL. We're still going to use APIs. One thing that we're not going to use in our IIoT infrastructure that's noticeably missing is that proprietary stuff. We're not going to use proprietary connections for our IIoT infrastructure. We're going to use open protocols like MQTT, DMP3, L uh, lightweight, machine to machine, you name it. Okay. Um, this is what that architecture is going to look like. And so that, and, and by moving the infrastructure to that, we're able to create this where each, each piece of software, each, each uh, PLC, um, everything digital is a node in an ecosystem, all right? So I wanna, I wanna show you something here real quick, all right? So you guys remember that PLC I showed you just a second ago, okay? I'm gonna go back to that drawing so I can kind of explain what I've got here. Um, so I have uh, a Control Logics uh, L555, I've got a Raspberry Pi right over here, and I've got um, a CMT SVR made by Maple Systems that supports um, Sparkplug B here. Uh, on my machine here, I have a, I've got Ignition Maker running, so let's go ahead and launch that. So I've got Ignition running. So I've got a traditional um, connection between Ignition and my Control Logic PLC over here. I've got a, if you'll you'll notice, if you look here, I've got a thermocouple right here, uh, measuring the temperature of the room, um, and it's coming into this I/O card. All right, the Control Logic PLC is talking to Ignition over uh, over an out the legacy Allen Bradley driver because this is version. I think I'm running version 16 in there. Okay, so we're using OPC. We're using native Allen Bradley protocols to talk to the PLC. Then we're talk using OPC UA to browse any of the data points uh, in ignition, okay? And so I've got this thermocouple and I've got, you know, process control that, I, that I'm using in this application. What are your thoughts on Ignition Maker, Walker? And also you guys leave it in the comments. Uh, I think it's badass. I like it a lot. I mean, it's great for tinkerers. Um, I think it's weird they don't put vision in it. You know, they make you use perspective. Uh, but I mean, it, it's long overdue. I mean, there's no other company that does this. And for those of you that don't know, Ignition, Ignition created the Maker Edition for students and, and like tinkerers. Okay. Um, oh, I didn't need to do this. Sorry. Let me just... I forgot I'm using perspective. So I mean, I, I've got this traditional application, guys. Um, and, oops, sorry, wrong one. So I got this traditional application, all right, and um, I'm looking at my PLC, I'm talking to the PLC natively, and I'm monitoring the temperature in the room. If I come over and you know, touch my thermocouple, you know, put my hand on it. You're going to see the temperature going up. Um, you know, this is your traditional process control, right? This is the, the, the typical industry 3.0 uh, 
um, technology. Here's the difference that when we when we go to industry 4.0 is um, I've also uh, I want to go back to this drawing. So at the same time that I've got an I've got ignition using a traditional Allen Bradley driver pulling that PLC at every five seconds um, and I'm visualizing it on a traditional screen. I also have this CMT SVR using the Allen Bradley driver. So this is an edge device. It is talking to the PLC. It is converting that PL, converting that data into MQTT spark plug B. Actually, I'm not using spark plug right now. And I have a MQTT broker running um, on this Raspberry Pi. Okay. And the reason I'm using the Raspberry, I also have a broker running on ignition and I'm marrying them together. But the reason I'm using the Raspberry Pi is to show you how easy it is to create this IoT infrastructure. Okay. So I've got a Raspberry Pi running and, and, I'm, and then I, what I did was I plugged in a new node. That new node is MQTT Explorer, okay? So the MQTT Explorer is now, all I've done with the Explorer is I installed Explorer and I subscribed to the ecosystem, okay? So what I did was I said, I point to the broker and subscribe to the data. This is completely separate from process control, okay? It is... I, I am, what I've done is I've added a node that subscribes to that data. And now I can use this data for whatever I want. If I want to run node red on that Raspberry Pi and do some calculations, I can. If I want to bring the entire namespace into another application, so that could be Factory Studio, which supports that. It could be, um, it could be Hybyte, which supports it. It could be, um, Ignition, it could be um, anything that supports subscribing to an MQTT broker. I can pull the entire namespace of all the data in and I can run and I can build my own applications. Okay. And if I create information, if I create information from that data, I can publish it back into the namespace, back to the broker and create additional content. So one of the things that I can do is, uh, let me do this. And, uh, there. All right, here we go. So I've got node red running here. Okay. So it's, it's running on that, that Raspberry Pi. I didn't even know if I started the stir. So I've got a little state injection. So what I did was now I've in node red, what I've done is I've created context. Okay. And that context is state. Now I happen to be publishing that context into a flat part in the namespace. But what I could do is I could publish it right alongside that JSON if I wanted to. And I've created a new node that can create that context. I could I could write a flow that consumes the room temperature, creates additional information, and puts it right next to that JSON topic. That is the concept that we're talking about with Industry 4.0, is that we're creating this infrastructure, we're, we're building it on a technology stack that allows us to produce consume data and produce information, and we don't place any limitations on anyone. And I let me say this. And I can't remember if I said this in the dry run earlier or if I said it in this already. So if I've already said it, forgive me. Uh, we were having this conversation with a, a huge pharmaceutical company a couple weeks ago. Okay, one of the biggest pharma companies in the world, and we've been working with them for a few months on work. These are very smart people. Okay, this company hires the smartest people on the planet. We're not smarter than they are. We take a different approach. That's all it is. Okay, and we have experience taking that different approach. Um, they, they, one of the questions that they asked was, Hey, how do, you know, we have three pieces of software that can do, um, we have three pieces of software that can do, um, um, predictive analytics. And we have a holy war going on internally over who should do the predictive analytics. They said, how do we decide which piece of software to use? And my answer was you don't. Don't decide which one to use. Who, who cares which one to use? Create an ecosystem, create an environment where people can use whatever they want. Create the infrastructure built on a technology stack so they can use whatever they want. Okay. All right, let, go, uh, Zach, are, have any other really important questions come up yet? Uh, yeah, someone mentioned that OSI Pi uh, supports MQTT, Alak Patil. It does. I, it does. I, I said that. Okay. 
Yeah, and so um, what would make oh, it oh, oh, what would make it not a, a unified namespace though? It, it, it can it can be. Uh, this question's come up a bunch of times. Um, so the, the same pharmaceutical company they're proposing using OSI Pi as a unified namespace, and they asked me, "Can we can we do this?" And I said, "You can, but you shouldn't. You can make a one minor change, one small change to your architecture where O." If you make OSI Pi the unified namespace, it becomes the center of the hub. Okay, it, it becomes all you, what you can do is still use it to build asset frames. You can still use it to have to be a single source of truth for all time series data. But what you should do is have it publish its entire namespace to a standalone broker, which is what we generally do, and then have the other applications like they want to use ThingWorks as their dashboarding tool. Instead of having ThingWorks consumed directly from OSI Pi for nearly all data, you have th you have OSI Pi generate the asset frames, publish it into a separate broker, and have OS and have ThingWorks consume it from the unified namespace. Here's why: because you don't want all the other nodes in your ecosystem publishing into OSI Pi for lots of reasons. There are business reasons, there are architectural reasons, there are there are um, strategic reasons. Uh, not the least of which is Aviva purchased OSI Pi. Okay. Uh, that 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 purchase doesn't make sense to me. Don't don't again. It can OSI Pi serve as a unified namespace? The answer is yes. People have asked me this question several times. The answer is it absolutely can. So can Canary Labs. But that doesn't mean that you should use it as your unified yeah. namespace. So Al Alok said he's worked with OSI Pi skill set for almost 12 years. What would you recommend People like him who have a lot of Pi experience, what should they do to advance their career for Industry 4.0? They should start working with um, Ignition, Factory Studio, Canary Labs. Um, you should start working with Flow Software. You should work with Hibite. You should reach out to the guys at CodeFlow. What here? Here's the thing. Let me let me. And here's the. This is my appeal to the engineer. Okay. Um, if you look at the course of my career, my whole goal has always been to help save and create middle-class jobs in the U.S. Ever since I was in college, I made, you know, if you guys watch our videos, I've explained why I do this and why I give this stuff away. I focused on technology very early on instead of individual solutions. I, if you look at, at what I can do, all the things that we did a survey, what are people's skill sets on a scale of one to five? You know, the average number was like, you know, somewhere between one and three on basically every category. You know, I'm a four or a five on everything except for web development. And that's not because I'm smarter than anybody who took that survey. It's because I focused on the technology. I didn't focus on the individual pieces of software. Mm. I always focused on the technology. If you look, look at it this way, if you focus on the technology, that technology is MQTP, Sparkplug B. If you read the OPC UA spec, if you read the Sparkplug B spec, the OPC UA spec is like that thick. And, and that equates into that big, huge header and payload that they sent. And the, and the MQTP Sparkplug B spec is like that big. And that translates into this little tiny header and payload that they sent, right? They, if you focus on the technology, then it makes you fluent in all of the solutions that use that technology. But if you, if you focus on the solution, if I learn only how to use Studio 5000, or I, I learn the mechanics of using Studio 5000, instead of focusing on, the, focusing on the technology that Studio 5000 and Ladder Logic and Function Block and Structure Text is, then you're only fluent in Studio 5000. That's my point. That's the difference. If, so to the guy who's been working on to the guy who's been working on um, um, the the uh, OSI oh, Pi, yeah. you need to start working with other technology. Okay, uh, oh, I, I'm not I, I'm not anti OSI Pi. I think it's a phenomenal solution, but I would never put it in the in, as someone's unified namespace. Never, not in a million years. Yes. Um, so uh, I, I want. I have a couple. I have a couple of. Um, things I want to go through after this. So let's answer a couple of questions, Zach. Yeah, so... Um, hey, uh, real, real, real quick. So Jet asked, does Walker have I, COVID, though? <laughs> I did not have COVID, no. Um, hey, real quick, can can you guys, um, on a scale of one to five, can you guys respond in the chat 
how va how valuable you think this this has been. I mean, I'm not getting off. I'll, I'll stay until I'm done. If you guys want to stay ten minutes after or something, but why? Guys... Oh, people are asking why spark plug, and then why someone asked why manufacturers sometimes implement vanilla spark plug and why they're not op adopting spark plug B. Okay, so uh, the the why why spark plug B. Um, the answer to that question is because spark plug B was written by the guy who invented MQTT. And that was after he spent two decades trying to, uh, two decades trying to, to use MQTT for, um, industry and spark plug B is the standard for MQTT. If somebody writes a better standard, I'm going to advocate for that one. But spark plug B is, is the standard. It, it covers all the bases. Arlen Nipper is a is a walking talking genius okay and he he and his team wrote the standard all right so we got a lot of uh a lot of fives right. four and all fives right, so coming is, in all right so it is valuable all right cool manny bernab shows at 3.5 so i'll, I'll yeah. answer his question he asked where can you yep. find influencers putting out valuable content like this i'll answer this one it's definitely going to be in the discord there's a lot of people out there on linkedin and youtube yeah. they're in our discord and we have and a Twitter. specific we have a, yeah, and Twitter. Uh, well, w right now we have specific Discord channels for people, uh, you guys, that if you join the Discord and you put out content, you can share it in a specific channel for LinkedIn. Right. Or Mario, LinkedIn. Mario Ishikawa, he's one of the guys who, who shares his content. Uh, the LMTX guy, he, he shares his content in Discord. Uh, all like-minded people are sharing their content on the Discord server. Absolutely. You guys need to be creating content because that's going to Sean, enforce Sean the learn. Yeah. Sean and Justin have both done, you know, Sean did like, he, you know, I can't remember what he called it. Forgive me, Sean, but on like Friday nights, you know, for a long time he was doing like, uh, what's somebody call it? He was doing these trainings for guys in the oil and gas field. And I mean, it was like under the hood, you know, nuts and bolts training. I mean, really valuable content. Um, yeah, any last questions? And I, I there's a couple of things I want to go through before we close out, Zach. Okay. Um, and it, by the way, this is just the beginning. This is really the foundation for Digital Mastermind. We're taking all this stuff that we've talked about here, and um, and we're and we're 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 using it to teach people how to help companies digitally transform. Okay. Um, automation mercenaries. Thanks, John Sullivan. Uh, it was that automation Merck. Thank you, John. Um, uh, all right. Important, important general concepts when digitally transforming. Okay. Number one, you have, to, when you are, when you're helping a customer digitally transform or you're developing a solution that a customer is going to use, if you're an OEM, whatever, you have to know what your digital strategy is. Okay. You need to approach every project as one part of a bigger whole. I've had this conversation many times. No project in the industry 4.0 world stands alone. It is all part of a much larger whole and you have to know where it fits. Uh, number three, make absolutely no assumptions about how data will be consumed. So that is, you do not decide what, what um, predictive analytics tool they're gonna use. Create the infrastructure so that they can pick the tool they want, okay? It's much easier for you to give people a list of requirements that their solution has to meet. Hey guys, just make sure you use something that uses Spark plug B and, or MQTT. It doesn't have to be Spark plug B, but I prefer that it does. Uh, we are usually assigned on a particular and don't seem to have a choice. Then Saad, hey Saad, Noor, go work for a different company. Go work for a different company. My team is made up of absolutely gifted engineers who other companies let let them leave, and I'm and and they came to, to Intellic because we're doing the stuff they want to do. And Saad, there will be more and more people. Uh, Paul Wright had an exec. Yes, uh, that's very easy to do. I had an exec at one of the major PLC OEMs say recently that the whole MQTT architecture is great in theory, but no one has yet. Uh, crap! Hold on a second. Um, no one has yet deployed that in production anywhere. Can you help me prove them wrong? Yeah, not, that's easy. Um, I ask you to do two things. Have that exec come on my podcast. 
I promise you he won't be an exec for that company once it's done. Um, unless he's the CEO, he might still have his job. But any other executive, whoever told you that, I'll have his job. So I would encourage you to have him come sit on our podcast. That I tell you right now, dude, I hope to God that's not like a publicly traded company. Um, Guys, feel free to by, share this uh, webinar. By the way, Opto 20, webinar. all you really have to do is call Benson at Opto 22 and ask him or ask uh, um, the guys at Easy Automation or ask the guys at Seaman who have sat in my office if whether or not MTTT is successfully being deployed from the edge. And the answer is absolutely 100% without question. Opto 22's entire business is built on it. Bedrock Automation's entire business is built on it. So, um, factory, uh, what's your opinion from Rafi? Uh, what's your opinion for a new factory collect data to one OPC UA server and then convert? I, that's that happens all the time, Rafi. Um, what what I'm and that that's really more of a legacy. That's how you're integrating legacy equipment. So the Rafi asks the question: What's your opinion for a new factory collecting data to one OPC UA server and then convert to MQTT? or add MQTT protocol converters in each machine. That works, if that's the digital strategy, that is going to work and it will scale. As long as that OPC UA server is um, isolated on a production uh, production VLAN, right? So that's only unicast traffic on there. And it's at the plant layer. It's not, they don't have an OPC server above a plant. So it's covering a whole business unit over the WAN. That's never gonna scale. But we ran yes, into that problem in Correct. 2014. Right. That architecture will work, what you're describing there, Rafi. That will work. Yes. Uh, how can I connect ignition to ERP and MES? All right. Depends on which MES. Through ERP, what you want to use, I'm not, I don't give Sepasoft a shout out very often, but they do have a business connector that they developed for ignition, a business connector module that uh, basically allows you to consume any VAPI and, and, and generate a namespace with it. It's phenomenal. Um, so that, that's how you would do it with Ignition. It's called the Business Connector from Cephasoft. Does cloud equal not secure? JetLife, all right. So JetLife asks the question, does cloud equal not secure? And the answer of course is no, not, not even close. I wanna do, a, I wanna clarify something on cloud real quick. Instead of using the term cloud, I want the community to get comfortable using the term on-prem cloud and off-prem. Off-prem is the traditional cloud, like go to AWS S3, generate a VM, I'm, you know, my data is living alongside other people's data. It's separated only by a VLAN. That's called off-prem. I'm using a cloud solution in the cloud, okay? Um, the the on-prem cloud is, I don't know if you guys know this, but you can go to Amazon Web Services or Azure Enterprises can, and they can basically buy the metal from them. So they can say, I, I want cloud services but I want my data to live on metal that no that nobody else's data is on. You could do that. That's called on-prem. You can also deploy cloud solutions inside your business if you want to. You can do that too. Kafka, you do it with Kafka all the time. Uh, what are your customers, Michael Dowdell, what are your customers saying about renting versus buying? I'm seeing customers very concerned about TCO, total cost of ownership jet life. Do I have to move to Texas? Uh, no, actually our team doesn't live I, our teams all over the country, actually all over the world. Um, Michael Dowdell, uh, most of our customers want some type of SaaS model. Um, so what we do is we do total cost of ownership. Uh, we put it in a quarterly number for them and it makes it makes it so they can digest it. So what we do is we take TCO total, total cost of ownership and we, we break that down into a quarterly number. We generally are amortizing that over like a five year, five year period and giving them that number. This is your TCO. And that generally makes the CFO happy. Um, all right, let me um, let me finish the, these uh, these points here real quick. And then we're just about to, I want in steps to digital transformation. So before you guys go, this is important. This is actually how you digitally transform people. Um, number four, we wanna treat all producers and consumers of data as a node in the ecosystem. You gotta remember that. You wanna build a technology stack, don't build a software or solution stack. Do not build a wall on top of a couch. And most importantly, remain agile. You are going to learn information throughout this process that you will want to incorporate in future solutions. So you have to be able to adjust. So if you're using like waterfall methodology, if you're quoting projects 
turnkey. Stop doing that. Okay. Remember, digital transformation is a strategy. It is not a project. Okay. You have to, you have to be agile. Is this the opportunity of a lifetime? It was perfect to ask you our remote. Can we, uh, well, hold on, cloud enact technologies. Can we implement cloud-based system in a pharma plant validated as per 21 CFR part 11? What about data, secu data security? The answer is yes, you can. You primarily do that through segmentation. Um, cloud enact, uh, the answer is absolutely. But if you're saying off-prem cloud, the answer is yes, you can, sort of. Um, you will meet the 21 CFR Part 11 requirement if the if the cloud solution is connected over a dedicated VPN pipe and there's no external access. Um, bring the core values of the customer. Do not try to couple product with application. Yeah, that's a very good comment. All right, here we go, guys. Uh, the first meeting. Um, so when you have that first discussion with a customer. Um, or you are, I'm a vendor and I want to sell my solution. Here are the six questions you got to have answered. Okay. Number one, you need to, you have to quantify where they are now digitally. The best way to do that is to do it in relation to this stack. Okay. The clouds, the, the six layer automation stack. Number two, you have to ascertain strategically where they want to go. Generally what they say is, you know, I want a single source of truth for my data and I want to put real time data in the hands of people. That's generally what they say. Number three, you have to ascertain where you think they should go. So there needs to be two opinions here. There needs to be what they have ascertained based on their knowledge, and you need to apply your knowledge to where they should go. Number four, what do they um, identify as their pain points? Number five, what pain points do they have that they're not aware of? That's your value to the conversation. Whether you're a OEM who writes software or whether you're an integrator is gonna help merge it all together, you're contributing the pain points that they're not aware of. And then number six, ask this damn question. Can I help them? If you can't help them, don't waste your time. Whether you're a vendor, it doesn't matter. If, you, if you're not capable of helping them or they don't wanna be helped, don't waste your time. All right, and then the steps to digital transformation. This is what we're gonna be going over in Digital Mastermind next week. This is really the nuts and bolts of next week. Um, step one, you inventory their business. Okay, that is how do they operate? Step two, you inventory their intelligence. What data do they generate? Number three, you connect the intelligence to the network. Everything's gotta be connected, right? Number four, you create a unified namespace. That's single source of truth. Number five, you integrate the intelligence to the unified namespace. So consumers are going to subscribe to data and um, people who create the information are gonna publish it into the namespace. Uh, you're gonna present the information to people. So what they need, when they need it, how they need it. This is in the form of dashboards, MES solutions, SCADA, et cetera. Then we stand back and we start learning from their new knowledge. Just by virtue of putting the information and data in front of people, it's gonna, they, they are going to come up with ideas to improve their business that they didn't, they, they didn't have before. Then we're gonna expand what, we, what they need based on our new knowledge, okay? Number nine, we're gonna integrate um, machine learning. Okay. Number 10, we're going to integrate AI. And this is a, we, we're still trying to figure out how to teach people this. Okay. Um, how to integrate that, how to teach people this piece. Number 11, you're going to learn from the new knowledge again. Okay. And number 12, you're going to expand what we need based on our new knowledge. That is literally the steps to digital transformation to take an organization from here to over here. What we're going to have, what we're going to do in the digital mastermind, and I'm assuming there'll be multiple steps in it, is we're going to we're going to start with inventory business, and we're going to go through how to do that. What's the process you go through to inventory business? Uh, and then the last pieces, Zach. I don't know how many people stuck around, but uh, why does digital transformation fail? You pick the wrong technology, you pick the wrong partners, or you have the wrong strategy. And the biggest risks that you're going to face in digitally tra trying to digitally transform um, a consumer is internal politics is number one. Not everyone wants to succeed. Succeed. Number two, every single person doing this is learning, including you. You have to be able to adjust your strategy based on new knowledge. And I and this is not just engineers. I'm talking to OEMs here who make solutions. And number three, you got to remember the 80-20 rule. 
80% of all the tangible results come in the last 20% of development. And in this case, it comes in the last 20% of the transformation. All right. That's it, man. You want to stop sharing uh, for a second? Yeah. That's so it. we can wrap this up. Guys, I know there was a lot of questions that we didn't get a chance to answer to, but uh, you know, what's our plan? What's our plan for answering those questions? Um, if definitely the discord is going to be the best place because not only can Walker myself and Vaughn answer your questions, but the community can answer each other's questions. I saw Sean in there answering questions. So, uh, links below to join the discord server and also to learn more about the mastermind next week. The, um, yeah, I, are there any, are there any outstanding questions that people want to have me answer right now? Um, if there's something I didn't answer, go ahead and throw it in the chat and I'll see it because the chat's scrolling in front of me and I'm happy to answer, answer any additional questions. Thank you. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Hopefully this is valuable. I, it, and I, you know, don't worry about my feelings. I want to hear, um, yeah, this need, it's, it's important that this is, this is meaningful for people. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, guys. Um, Dr. Helly. LMTX asked me to create a security channel. So I went and did that already in the Discord yeah. under Industry 4.0. We have a new it, topic for security. Excellent. I put it in my notes um, that, hey, we need a security channel. Because there's a couple of guys in there that are clearly high-level security experts. Is there still room to join the full training? Um, I don't know. Is there? Um, so there were, before we started this webinar, there were four seats, uh, available at early bird. So you guys, uh, if you are in consideration, um, we're going to leave the early bird available to the end of the day. So even if we get Thanks, more Mike. than four, um, secure the early bird today, I imagine that'll sell out. Uh, Thank and then you, it'll Chris. go up to the full price, um, maximum of 25 seats though. We're going to limit it to that. And, uh, we're about like 10 right now. So, uh, Zaid, uh, Zaid Amir, can you show us a standard architecture for, uh, industry 4.0. Um, the answer is yes. Let me see if I've got one on my OneNote right now. Oh, and uh, John, um, one option is, or for anyone that is working with a team of engineers or a plant, if you guys all wanted to get into one conference room, uh, we're giving you guys the option to purchase one ticket and get a group of guys or girls in that room together. Uh, but we do limit it to one ticket for one Zoom seat, just out of hey, respect for everyone else. Um, I don't have the architecture drawing on this one note. Um, I will share it in the Discord. Uh, so please, hey, Vaughn, write that in the notes that I'll... To, uh, Zachary Tinkler, this is a good question. It comes up a lot. So Zachary Tinkler asked, how do you suggest you prepare a workforce of controls, maintenance people to troubleshoot uh, and support open source, high level language solutions on the edge? Some controls guys may only know ladder and some network. Um, the answer to that question is you, won't, you don't need to train them to do that because we're not fundamentally changing the way we do process control. You're still using ladder, you're still using structured text, you're still using function block. They're going to maintain the process on the edge in the same way. The difference is, is we are going to add tools that allow them to consume context that they've never seen before. So the control, I, I was a mechanic and electrician many, 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 many moons ago. And the, I, I, the first thing I would do is go to PLC code to diagnose a problem. There were two types of, you know, there were two types of uh, electrical technicians. There were the guys that went out with a meter and a screwdriver and there were guys the younger guys would always look in the plc code to try to diagnose the problem i was that guy i was the the latter guy they're still going to do that they're that's not going to change what is going to change is that they are going to understand that the data that they're creating inside their plc code is going someplace else it's part of a much bigger strategy but they won't need they won't need to understand the technology of that strategy unless they want to unless they want to get training on it it's not going to change the way they do their job um, if, they, if they don't want it to, but it's going to create tools and information and data that they don't currently have. I hope that answers that question. 
Uh, there's only one live, but we'll be making a recording. Correct. Joel Messina speaking the truth. All right. All right, guys. Um, hey, Zach, how many people stuck around until 14? Yeah, so we had a we had a hundred viewers. Uh, you know, within the first ten minutes, everyone got in here. Uh, yep. We had a hundred viewers for the most of the part, and we still have seventy six right now. So we we had oh, some people shit. that had a tail yeah. off. Um, but yeah, uh, right. links links below for everything, and we'll send you an email with the recording. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you, appreciate Walker. Every, I appreciate everybody. Any parting comments, questions, concerns? Vaughn, do you have any feedback? Uh, I just think it's uh, awesome that we're engaging with the community the way that we are. The, I, I really like the fact that the Discord has taken off the way it has. Just keep just keep the good stuff coming, guys. Thank you. Hey, uh, Michael Dowdell, um, let me – I actually have that for you. Um, uh, so Michael Dowdell asks, what technical competencies should I be hiring to build a team? Um, the answer is um, – uh, we did that. It's in it's in that Brazil that video we shot for the institute in Brazil. I actually wrote. I actually put the list in. If we want to get, if you need, um, if you need some additional information on technical competencies, just reach out to me via email or reach out to Zach, and they'll put you in touch with me, and I I can I'll give you that list. But it, it's in the video that we shot for Brazil. Um, yeah, the Sinai it, video. It, yeah, it's the Sinai Sinai Institute video. Yep. Um, that basically shows like, here are the competencies you hire for industry 3.0. Here are the competencies you hire for industry 4.0. It was actually, yeah, there you go. Thanks, Mario. Um, yeah, we can share that with you. All right, cool. Um, appreciate everybody. We'll, uh, we will definitely do this again, I think. All right. Bye. All right. All right. See you guys. Zach, you staying on? Yeah, I'm staying on. All right, cool.